rolling. Three, two, one, action. Welcome to Ho Choco Podcast. Hello, Mitaki AP, and welcome to Ho Choco here at the center of St. Joseph's Indian School campus. I'm Scott Wooster. I'm joined by Hope McCloskey. Today, the two of us host Joseph Marshall III, the award-winning author of 18 books. He's a cultural and historical consultant. He's a teacher, craftsman, administrator, actor, and a public speaker. He joins us to tape for a series directed primarily to our families about the vital task of reinvigorating the cultural identity of Lakota youth. In this podcast, we learn about Sitting Bull's vision and cultural identity. Joseph, thank you so much for joining us today. It's good to have you here. Thanks for inviting me. I'm glad to be here. Mm-hmm. Looking forward to it. All right. So I'm going to go with a, a heavy hitter with this okay. question here. Okay. Sitting Bull's vision <clears throat> before greasy grass is huge. Yes. Can you tell <clears throat> a little bit about the vision mm-hmm. and then can you tell your interpretation of it? And maybe that's one question. And then can you tell what that might impart to today's Lakota youth mm. and, and what that might mean to them? Well, I sure give it a try. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, probably at least a month before the uh, Battle of the Greasy Grass or the Little Big Horn, which of course was in June of 1876, Sitting Bull um, did a Sundance, and which was unusual because it was in the spring and Sundances don't usually happen until, you know, midsummer. But he felt that the situation was important enough, I'm sure, that, that something like this was obviously warranted. Um, and so he f- did all the usual protocols. He offered 50 pieces of flesh from each arm um for the sundance and and during the sundance sometime in the process he had a vision he went into a trance and had a vision and in his vision he saw literally uh, men and horses cavalry soldiers or 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 long knives as we call them mila haska falling from the sky upside down into the circle of a Lakota encampment. That was basically his vision. And so he reported his vision to everybody who was there, uh, especially to the other elders. And of course, there were immediate reactions to what the vision might mean. And everybody was, the consensus was that this foretold a victory over the Long Knives. Mm -hmm because these, the soldiers and their horses were falling from the sky, bloodied, and obviously having been in battle. Um, and somewhere in that, he heard a voice. And I don't know the words exactly, but that voice said to Sitting Bull, I said, uh, I give you these because they have no ears and do not take anything that belongs to them. And so, of course, he reported all that too. And it just so happened that probably um, a week or two later, sometime later, before they got to, obviously, before they got to Greasy Grass, while the village was still on, on what's called Ash Creek, uh, scouts came from the south, meaning at the time in Wyoming, when they were looking for enemies in Wyoming, and reported a large column of soldiers and native allies coming north toward them, toward these people, toward the Lakota, and some of you know, the Cheyenne and Arapaho that were with them. And there was this was a large body of soldiers. I mean, several hundred, if not a thousand or so. And so the scouts went directly to Crazy Horse. Because Crazy Horse at that time was the overall military leader. Uh, Sitting Bull was probably the overall political leader at the time. So the scouts reported to Crazy Horse what they had seen. 
And so Crazy Horse gathered warriors and went to meet the enemy and fought them in the battle, a day-long battle, near the town where Sheridan, Wyoming is now. It's we call it the the battle where the girl saved her mother, her, her brother, uh, the Cheyenne girl. Uh, her name was I think well, I can't remember her name, but she she rode into battle as as several women did with their husbands or their brothers or their whatever they were part of, it. and they fought just as uh, as much as the men did. Her brother, who was a Cheyenne leader had his horse shot from under him, and he was caught in a crossfire between two groups of soldiers. So this young girl, probably 18, 19, 20 years old, was on her horse. She rode in the middle of that, the crossfire and rescued her brother and rode out with him. So that's why we call the battle where the girl rescued her brother. It's otherwise known as the uh, uh, Rosebud Battle. That occurred on June seventeenth, and so everybody thought, "Well, that's Sitting Bull's vision coming true." But a lot of the older people felt that that wasn't it, because the in Sitting Bull's vision, the soldiers were coming into a Lakota camp, and and Crazy Horse took his warriors fifty miles to to face the enemy. So there was a lot of discussion about that. And of course, about a week later comes, you know, Custer and the 7th Cavalry to attack uh, the encampment that had reached Greasy Grass. And everybody thought that that was those same soldiers coming back and attacking, which was not the case, obviously. But the interesting part of that, the Greasy Grass battle was that in the initial attack on the south end of the camp, there was a long, long two-mile encampment along the Greasy Grass River. Uh, they, the, the first common soldiers attacked from the south. And they rode in a column formation until their commander gave them order to form a skirmish line to, to face the oncoming warriors who were coming out of the village. Two or three of the soldiers' horses ran away with them. The soldiers on them and into the village and the, the soldiers couldn't control their horses so they took them right into the village and they were taken down by people and killed in the village so later on that people realized oh, this was the mm -hmm. vision that St. Bo was talking about where the soldiers were coming to our our village um, so of course you know the battle occurred it was three engagements over two days. And during the battle, uh, the, the, the warriors, the Lakota Cheyenne warriors, would pick up weapons that the soldiers had discarded, pistols, guns, because among us, we had a variety of, of weapons, but not, not consistent the way the army did. The army had the same rifle. Each man had the same rifle. Each man had a, a six-shot revolver. And each each soldier had available to him 125 rounds of ammunition. That was not the case with us. Mm -hmm. We had all kinds of weapons, mostly flintlocks, and a limited supply of powder and shot, powder and bullets. So a lot of our warriors went into battle with nothing but bows and arrows. And a, a lot is made about in history by white historians about that fact, saying that the only way that the 7th Cavalry was defeated because of the overwhelming firepower of the Lakota and Cheyenne, not to mention overwhelming numbers, which history has proven was not the case. Mm -hmm. uh, but, as I said, during the battle, uh, they picked up the guns and the bullets that the soldiers had discarded, or from dead bodies. And then after the battle, they stripped the the, um, the, clo the especially the five companies under uh, Custer's direct command, they stripped their bodies of clothing. And a lot of people now, and later on afterwards, debated about whether or not they should have done that. Because the vision said, do not take anything of theirs. Whether they meant that literally, mm -hmm. you know, the objects, the guns, the clothing, 
the bullets or whatever else they took. Or some people said, well, maybe what they meant was don't take on their ways. Don't take on their thinking. There's always been a debate about that. And, and as a kid, I listened to old people talk about that, debate back and forth. Well, this is what Sitting Bull meant. He meant that we should have left those guns and bullets alone. We shouldn't have touched them. And other people said, no, no, no. That's not what he meant. He meant that we shouldn't be like them. We shouldn't take on their ways. We shouldn't think like them. So th th there was a divided camp over what that vision exactly meant. But when you stop to think about it, because we have taken on their ways, as it were, we speak English, we dress like them. There's some of the things we can't avoid, you know, because things change. Uh, but when we start accepting their religion, we start accepting their lifestyle, then we're taking on their ways. And a lot of people think that we shouldn't, we should not have done that. We shouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. We should, you know, maintain who we are a as a group of people. So it all depends on which of those arguments you, you buy into. Right. It's still an interesting argument. Right. And as a kid to hear that argument mm -hmm. in from people who were right. closer to it, at exactly. least anyway, exactly. must have been fascinating. Right. And did, you ended up writing an entire book just about the battle. Right. right? Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. And the name of that was? It is the day that world ended at Little Big Yeah. Yep. Right. And I read that right. quite quite a long right. time ago. But if uh, if anybody ever wants a, a very in-depth look at that battle, that's mm -hmm. a that's a great resource, a great book for right. that. Um, I the last part of that question was, uh, what message does it have for today's Lakota? And I don't know if we we answered that or if we need to to go uh, more directly. Well, with that. you know, it, like I said, it all depends on which of those arguments you you buy into. Yeah, whether it was just literally just physical objects, or or the ways of the white people. Uh, but the fact remains, whatever argument you adhere to, we have lost a lot of our culture through acculturation and assimilation. Some of that was forced on us. You know, there's there's no getting away from that. Boarding schools, you know, you talked about boarding schools. And, and the one thing they did, among other, a lot of other things, was they, they didn't allow us to speak our language. Kids who went to school didn't were forbidden to speak Lakota or whatever other indigenous language. Um, so, you know, we did take on their ways, mm -hmm. uh, whether we like it or not. So the more of their ways we took on, the less, the more we gave up our, of ourselves. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, 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 philosophically, I sort of lean toward don't take their ways. I think that's what he meant. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And I look at it as it, working here at St. Joe's. I've been here 28 years now. And I just, I think it's so important that we as an organization take every opportunity to make sure mm -hmm. that the kids have that pathway to find those kinds right. of things. And that we we find people who can continue to teach those things and, exactly. and find a way to so get it mean. to the kids. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I know that as an alumni of St. Joe's, um, I, I've learned a lot from here, you know, from like teachers and classes and other extracurricular activities that mm -hmm. they have going on here and things at home that my grandparents, that my mom and just overall like environment have taught me. And I mentioned this during the break that since I'm away at school and I'm not in an environment where they culture Lakota and, uh, and I, I guess just that sense of identity. Mm -hmm and I'm away from home that it's, it's harder to grasp on that identity and learn more and to keep those, um, that knowledge relevant, you know, mm -hmm. cause at my school, they, they don't have a big Lakota population. They don't have a big American Indian population. Mm -hmm. There's probably 10 of us on campus, including me, you know, which is, it's wow. hard to relate to other people, especially, you know, like I have a, a a different background than even most American Indian mm -hmm. kids, Native American kids, mm -hmm. cause I went to a boarding school mm -hmm. and most of them have stayed on the reservations. Um, but 
I know that, that I've learned a lot from this talk. You know, like I, I, I just remember that story of where the girl saved her brother. You know, like、mm-hmm. I've learned that so long ago. And when he mentioned it, I was like, Oh my god, I know that story.、Right. You know, what a surprise! I actually、right. know something. And so it's just, yeah, it, it's it's hard because I've said before that there's a lot of distractions. There's a lot of things kind of keeping a lot of Lakota people from maintaining the culture. You know, and、uh, I've been introduced to a lot of things, but I know that there's some things that I will forever grasp on for from my culture, my identity.、Mm. You know, like the way I look, for one, is something that I'll never be able to let go of, nor will I ever want to.、Right. And、um, just my spirituality is never going to change. You know, like I, I still believe in Tukashila. I still believe what's going to happen to me and my family as long as we progress. You know, like w- w- the way we keep things is it's going to be benefit. Like beneficial to all of us, I know that and I believe that. So and but I don't know how other people are being taught as well, because、mm. I've never talked to, you know, like somebody in school and said, "What do you do at home?" You know, like, do、yeah. you go to Sundance? What do your grandparents、right. teach you? I've never had, I've never thought to have those conversations with people my age that come from Lakota backgrounds. You know, like, I, it's never been a thing that I I would want to bring up either because it feels so intrusive. But I feel like maybe at some point I would have to. You know, just say how much do you know about our culture? But I I know that as an undergrad student who's nearing the end of her four years,、uh, I have a lot to consider from this conversation alone, from just this one little snippet of talk right now versus all、uh, all the other things we've talked about today.、Right. And so I know that I'm looking forward to the next part of this conversation and seeing what I do know and what I don't know and what I should learn. Joseph, once again, thank you for joining us here in the Hochoka at the center of Saint Joseph's Indian School campus, where we talk about issues central to Native America today. Until next time, stay centered.